Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. The topic for today's webinar is Oregon's new energy storage project for resiliency and cost savings. Today's webinar is presented by the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, also known as SDAP. We have a number of excellent speakers on the line today. Before I pass it over to them, I'd like to go over a few quick housekeeping notes. All of our attendees for this webinar are in listen-only mode. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of this webinar. You can call in using a telephone, or you can connect using your computer mic and speakers. If you'd like to minimize the webinar console so that you can view the webinar full screen, you can use the little orange arrow that you see circled here. You can also use that arrow to expand the webinar console. Um, during the webinar, we encourage you to submit your questions and your comments as you think of them. We are going to save 15 to 20 minutes at the end of our presentations for a Q&A with the presenters. And we do expect to have a lot of people on the line. That means a lot of questions. So to make sure that we get to your question, type it in when you think of it. Don't wait until the very end. And you can do that by typing it into the question box on the webinar console and hitting send. A final note, this webinar is being recorded. We will send you an email within about 24 to 48 hours with a link to the webinar recording and a PDF of the webinar slides. And we'll also be posting these webinar materials on our website at CSET.org. So with that, I would like to pass it over to our moderator for today's webinar, Todd Olinsky-Paul. Todd is a project director at the Clean Energy States Alliance. Thank you, and welcome everybody to another great STEP webinar. Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce CISA and STEP, and then I will introduce very briefly our speakers. We have a lot of them today, so we're not going to take a lot of time on bios. Uh, we want to have plenty of time for questions at the end, so let's uh, move right into the introduction. Uh, Clean Energy States Alliance is a nonprofit located in Vermont. We are essentially a, a membership organization of state clean energy agencies and funds. Uh, you can see a lot of the state um, logos there on the screen. And essentially, CESA helps these states to develop and deploy all kinds of clean energy programs and policy. Uh, that's that's our primary role. Um, Samantha, why don't you advance uh, the slide for me, please? Um, CESA also does a number of other things related to uh, clean energy. And um, in this specific instance, uh, I want to introduce, if you haven't heard of it, the STEP project. It stands for Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership. Uh, this is a project that we conduct under contract with Sandia National Laboratories. It's funded by US Department of Energy, Office of Electricity. And uh, the primary uh, purpose is to uh, promote large-scale energy storage deployment um, projects in partnership with state and municipal entities. So CISA's role here is uh, primarily to bring states and sometimes municipal entities into partnership with Sandia and USDOE Office of Electricity uh, to jointly uh, deploy energy storage. We also do um, knowledge sharing, such as we're doing it with this webinar, but we also uh, produce reports and other other materials. Um, and we also support states in their policy development around energy storage. So uh, we work with states in putting together grant programs, in uh, designing uh, storage incentives, in designing procurement targets and programs, all, all sorts of energy storage policy. Could you advance the slide, please? So that's the background. Um, I will briefly introduce the speakers in the order we expect them to speak, and, um, and then we will move right into the presentations. I just want to remind everyone that we will be taking questions. You can type them into your uh, 
your console there under the, the questions heading. And after the presentations, I will relay the questions to the speakers and we'll get to as many as we can. So type them in as you think of them. So uh, speaking today, we have Dr. Emery Zhuk, the Director of Energy Storage Research at the uh, DOE Office of Electricity. Um, he will introduce the program and talk about some of the work that's uh, being done by DOE and uh, Sandia in various parts of the country on energy storage. Uh, we will then have Rob Delmar. Uh, Rob is uh, a field energy analyst uh, with the Oregon Department of Energy, and he will talk about the Oregon DOE's role in this project and put it in the context of some of the other work that Oregon is doing around energy storage. We will hear from Matt Ibaraki, a, an associate engineer at Eugene Water and Electric Board, or EWEB. This project is located at uh, EWEB, and they are uh, running the the day-to-day -day, um, project details, and so Matt will put the project in context in terms of EWEB's mission and uh, what they hope to accomplish. Uh, we'll hear from Phil Fisher, a sales director for NEC Energy Solutions, which is the battery provider for this project, and we've worked with NEC on a number of projects. Uh, Phil will give a brief outline of the, the battery technology and the specific uh, details of this uh, particular installation. And we will hear from Alex Headley, a postdoc at the Energy Storage Technology and Systems Department at Sandia National Laboratories. Alex is going to go into a great deal of detail um, and, and analysis regarding uh, primarily the project's uh, economics and uh, what kind of, of uh, applications and returns are expected. Uh, and there's been a lot of analytical work done around this project and similar projects in other parts of the country by, by Sandia. So as you can see, we're starting with a broad focus and getting more and more uh, specific as we as we go through the presentations. Dan Borneo from Sandia National Laboratories is also with us. I don't know if he will want to speak, uh, but he will be around for questions and may say a few words as well. And uh, I'm I'm moderating. So I think that's it for the speakers. And um, again, thanks for joining us. I'll pass this now to Dr. Zhuk for his introductory remarks. Hello, uh, I'm Imri Zhuk. I direct the energy storage research pro pro uh, program at the Department of Energy Office of Electricity. And it's a distinct pleasure to be joining my colleagues uh, in bringing about this project in Eugene, Oregon. Basically, it's about designing a business case. And we have to consider two components. One is the cost and one is the value. Now, we are not going to talk very much about cost today. Uh, this is not a materials research project. Uh, we have a, a technology partner with whom we have worked before, NEC, and they provide the energy storage device. And then there's, of course, the power electronics and the facility itself. Uh, what's interesting is establishing the value of a storage system. And we like to go with multiple benefit streams, some of which are monetized and some which, of which are unmonetized. Uh, examples of monetized uh, benefits are arbitrage, uh, buy low, sell high, uh, frequency regulation, something that uh, we have started uh, some years ago, and then there are demand charges, which come by the month and by the year. And those turn out to be big savings if you take advantage of them. Now, this really is a resiliency project. 
And resiliency is not easy to monetize. It's one of the unmonetized ones. So uh, what we're going to try is we're going to try to get our resiliency, uh, but we will justify the project itself by the monetized benefits. So we need to build a business case for value. This is important. Resilience is one of the big concerns these days for not only energy storage, but for uh, a lot of other technologies uh, that are being applied to the grid or to microgrids or to specific situations. If you look at the diagram up there, you see the annual average temperatures in Washington, D.C., an obvious and ominous trend going upwards. This translates directly into uh, money. The second diagram shows the number of natural disasters exceeding $1 billion in damages by year. Now, this one only goes to 20, uh, uh, what is it, uh, 2016, but since then, uh, things have gotten considerably worse. So that tr upwards trend is there in terms of financial uh, problems as well. Uh, we don't have to ask what those disasters are. There are many of them. Uh, you have uh, hurricanes with torrential rains. Uh, you have big ones like the one that uh, wiped out <clears throat> most of the electric system in Puerto Rico. It's still being uh, rebuilt. Uh, it'll take a while. Hopefully, we can make the system better uh, as time goes on. But there is also earthquakes such as the one in Mexico and recently uh, rather disastrous lava flows in Hawaii. All of these trends are going on, and as far as they are climate determined, uh, they things will get worse and not better. Uh, one rough hint that we can use is that in the experience shows that every dollar spent on protection measures can prevent four dollars in repairs after a storm. So we have to design our business case so that resilience is built into the system. Now, the trouble is, uh, items such as resiliency, military energy assurance, or emergency preparedness are difficult to monetize, as we have mentioned. But often they are the primary reason why a project is undertaken. Uh, Notably, microgrids with renewables and storage provide good solutions for resiliency. But while the primary reason may well be resilience, the business case of a project still has to rest on monetizable benefit streams. Uh, you can't take uh, unmonetized benefits to the bank. So, luckily, we have some very good examples for this. So, we know it works. Uh, the first example I will do is uh, Vermont Public Service Department uh, project together with DOE. And Green Mountain Power carried it out. Uh, it's in Rutland, Vermont. And the project uh, con uh, is constituted of four megawatts. Uh, of storage integrated with two megawatts of PV. And what it intends to do is it, it intends to provide an emergency shelter during uh, outages and, uh, well, events of nature. The picture shows the groundbreaking back in 2014. And the year and a half later, 
the system was completed. The storage uh, devices actually are back here, those little white things. And out here is the PV field, uh, which uh, was established at the same time. Now, the way this works is the system can be completely islanded to provide emergency power for this resilient microgrid, which serves a high school, which is an emergency center for the town. Now, ordinarily, of course, uh, it will not be an emergency situation. And then uh, the system is completely open and the storage provides ancillary grid services at demand charge reduction and the PV provides green power for the grid. Uh, so how do we make this pay for itself? And indeed, we do make it pay for itself. Well, we have two demand charge uh, tools which we can use. One is the monthly peak load, which is payment for using the transmission line. And the other one is a yearly peak load, uh, which is identified by, the ISO, by ISO New England. And it takes care of the regional capacity uh, during load excursions. Now, the yearly peak only occurs once, and the monthly peak, of course, occurs 12 times. And while it is not exactly forecast, uh, by and large, one has a pretty good idea because of the weather and what have you. So, uh, the first year that this system was put into operation, uh, Green Mountain Power managed to catch the yearly peak. The yearly peak occurs up here, and the storage was completely discharged, thereby lowering the peak, and this resulted in $200,000 uh, of savings due to capturing this yearly peak. Now, this has been going on quite well, but it has gone so well that, in fact, it has generated a lot of other projects, storage projects, and we can talk of a Vermont storage ecosystem. Uh, the Green, uh, Green Mountain Power Rutland project was referenced as a model in the Vermont Energy Storage Plan and also a model on how to work with the Department of Energy. Uh, legislative hearings on potential storage mandates were held, uh, and the Vermont Department of Public Service commissioned energy, an energy storage study uh, to find out further details about uh, the possibility of doing a mandate. In the second year, the peak was even more serious, and $600,000 were saved uh, in the August 6th peak. Meanwhile, new projects have been started. One is by Green Mountain Power at Panton, one megawatt storage linked with solar, again for resiliency. Uh, they started a residential battery aggregation pro uh, a program where up to 2,000 batteries will be installed behind customer meters. Nearby, the Burlington International Airport has decided to make a microgrid which will consist of a one megawatt four hour battery uh, with 500 kilowatt of solar, because obviously an airport must continue to run, so uh, it's an obvious place to uh, do this storage microgrid for resiliency. Green Mountain Power themselves have, are, are considering new projects at Milton, Ferrisburg, and Essex each with both PV and storage. And the small Vermont Electric Co-op has decided to put 1.9 megawatt of storage and 5.3 megawatt hours of storage. So as you can see, uh, this project, which we started together with the uh, Vermont Public Utility Division has 
attracted a lot of attention and has resulted in a lot of uh, interesting new projects. Now we'll go to a different project, this time in Sterling, Massachusetts. Uh, it was built on a grant from the Massachusetts Community Clean Energy Resiliency Initiative. Uh, we added some money to that, and uh, it ended up with a two megawatt, two, two hour storage device uh, with an existing 3.4 megawatt of PV. And NEC uh, provided the uh, storage device uh, just as it will provide a storage device for Eugene, Oregon. The capital cost of the system was about $2.7 uh, million dollars for two megawatts. And uh, what was particularly interesting for this one is that we calculated the potential benefits beforehand. Uh, Sandia National Laboratory has detailed models, and we were able to ascertain that by using arbitrage monthly peaks and annual peaks, we could expect a simple payback of 6.7 years. This was rather brilliantly care, uh, proven out uh, from the first year's uh, record of uh, what was being saved. Between December 2016 and November 2017, the actual sa savings uh, on arbitrage monthly peaks and annual peaks added up to a total of almost $400,000. And this is, of course, how it works. Uh, this is the uh, way the daily variation goes. And then when the monthly peak occurs, the storage kicks in. And this single storage event saved $16,900 multiplied by 12, and you get $200,000 per year. Now, taking together the last 23 months of operation, the savings per month were $32,000. Interesting enough, the monthly maintenance was only $400 not million dollars, not a thousand hours, but $400. Again, the payback uh, on the actual uh, savings uh, ended up as seven years. Now, because we cannot work with uh, each utility directly, uh, we have documented this and Dan Borneo uh, has uh, written an energy storage procurement guidance document, uh, which is available for free and is based on our experience uh, in helping uh, the Sterling system uh, put itself together. Uh, rather pleasantly, we won a GTM Grid Edge Award on it. And astonishingly, Visitors from Germany, Switzerland, Denmark, Sweden, England, Ireland, Australia, Japan, Malaysia, Taiwan, Brazil, and Chile have visited this small town uh, an hour and a half west of uh, Boston. Uh, previously, its main fame uh, had been that the song Mary Had a Little Lamb was written there. But now they've become famous as an application of storage. And again, this has borne ample fruit. Uh, the, uh, the Sterling themselves have started a community project of solar and stor storage, uh, an organization which serves 42 municipal utilities in Massachusetts, is now providing centralized operation and dispatch services. Uh, seven more Massachusetts municipal utilities have resiliency grants with storage. Uh, we have a, a joint project with National Grid and Tesla in Nantucket on transmission line deferral in Worcester, Massachusetts, again with National Grid. Uh, we have a system that tackles wind power uh, with, a, with vanadium flow batteries. And 
Massachusetts has adopted a 1,000 megawatt hour utility energy storage procurement target, uh, as well as further grants and uh, support uh, of the system. So, uh, what do I consider a sex successful energy storage installation from the point of the Department of Energy? Well, first it has, has to function effectively and safely. That includes not burning up, not breaking down. Second, it has to provide the promised benefits. So if it's going to be a resilience project, it has to be able to uh, isolate itself. It has to provide the benefits, the resilience, resilience benefits that it promised. It should pay for itself, at least in principle. We are getting into uh, an uh, into an era where we should no longer have to uh, rely on outside funding. Uh, projects should be able to pay for themselves in in order of six seven years. I would like to see some consideration of the end of life. What happens to this unit when it's being decommissioned? Uh, so far, we have seen very little attention to this, but I would very much want to see that. And finally, I would like each project to help establish a regional storage ecosystem. I'm not interested in individual projects. It's the aggregate. Uh, it's furthering the role of energy storage in uh, the resilience picture. So, new technologies are being developed, cost will go down, safety and reliability will increase. But also important, with every successful project, the value proposition will become clearer and continue to increase. And then, of course, more jobs will be created. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Emery. And we will go now to Rob Delmar from Oregon Department of Energy. All right, thanks, Todd. And I'm happy to be here. So um, Oregon Department of Energy has kind of two roles within the project that we're gonna look at at Eugene Water and Electric Board. One was that we provided some direct funding for their project, but um, another one of our roles has been through a US DOE Solar Energy Strategies grant that we referred to as Solar Plus. And this was a collaboration between Oregon and Washington. And the idea was that we wanted to look at Solar Plus, a lot of the other um, side benefits that solar can bring. And so we had working groups that looked at community benefits, resource value of solar, low income benefits, and specifically resiliency benefits. And that's where Oregon Department of Energy came in. And um, so we grabbed onto the resiliency piece. And what we decided we would do with this grant was develop face to face workshops regarding utility battery storage systems in the Northwest. And um, the, the focus there was really face-to-face. -face. We wanted to get people in the room and um, discuss the, the technical aspects of these projects. And just to, for a little background, Oregon has 40 electric utilities, and 37 of those utilities are relatively small consumer-owned utilities. Um, that primarily get their power from a federal dam system known, known as BPA or the Bonneville Power Authority. Um, a lot of these uh, utilities are essentially just lines utilities. They don't do a lot of, um, of their own load generation. Um, they're responsible for essentially maintaining the system, but they're also responsible for resiliency and reliability. So we thought by using this sort of resiliency wedge that we might be able to get some of these utilities interested in battery storage. And so 
with this, we've kind of identified our target audience as being the utilities in Oregon and Washington. And more specifically within that target audience, we really wanted to get at the engineers. Um, we wanted technical content that was looking at <clears throat> essentially how to build and plan these facilities and not necessarily how to fund them. And so by, by doing that, we were able to further drill in on our target audience by going straight to the engineers. And we wanted to talk about switch gear and project management and um, all of the, the nuts and bolts of these projects, sizing, um, single line diagrams, uh, you know, remote monitoring, islanding. We wanted to really get into the technical aspects we recognize that funding is a huge piece of the puzzle, but that's not what we were tackling in this workshop series. So um, we really wanted to um, overcome that technical hurdle that exists in a lot of these small utilities where um, there could be a fear of batteries just from the technical hurdle. And before you even talking before you even talk about cost, it might be something that these folks just wouldn't want to really deal with. But by putting these workshops together, we are able to bring these utility engineers together. And when you get engineers together and start talking about highly technical content, you start building confidence and some excitement around projects. And so we, we really were looking at this sort of upstream benefit of expanding the technical knowledge of our local utilities. Um, we ended up doing three workshops. One was in Washington in the Olympic Peninsula. And for folks who know anything about Washington, the Olympic Peninsula is a um, fairly remote rural region with um, potential for a no number of natural disasters. And so they, that was our Washington location and they had um, real interest in the resiliency piece. So we went up to Squim, Washington and had a presentation there in early November. Um, <clears throat> we did one in central Oregon in the town of Bend. And in Bend, Oregon, we teamed up with a um, local energy symposium that was being put on. And so we had about 60 attendees. And this was the one exception to the utility engineers um, target audience where we had a lot of municipal leaders but we were happy to talk to them about uh, batteries and resiliency too. We changed the content to be a little less technical. Um, and then we had another, wa another workshop in Salem, Oregon, which is our capital. And it was a central location where we were able to draw um, a lot of utilities from the coastal region and um, really throughout the central part of the state. We're planning to do likely three more of these in 2019. And uh, I think with that, I'm going to go through a couple of slides here. These are just going to be really quick snapshots of the content that we had at these workshops. Um, our star presenter was the star of this webinar as well. It was eWeb. And so they talked about their grid edge battery storage demonstration project at Howard Elementary School. And they sent um, some, some great presenters and engage these um, utilities throughout the region. Um, up in Washington, we enlisted Puget Sound Energy. And Puget Sound Energy has been a regional leader in energy storage projects. They've got a glacier battery storage project, which was built in Glacier, Washington. This is kind of an end of the grid project where it was a remote town with um, fairly poor reliability record. And so the batteries help support the, um, the end of the grid reliability. Um, they've also done a Primus Flow battery. And so we got to hear about that project. And then we also heard about three projects in the planning phase. One is a <clears throat> behind the meter residential project similar to the meter aggregation or storage aggregation project that Emory mentioned. Um, behind the meter commercial, this will be a single facility. And then they also have an interesting one where they're doing a front of meter residential project where they're gonna be tying in at the transformer level 
on six houses that all have solar. And so they'll be able to look at how the um, storage can help facilitate the integration of multiple rooftop solar projects. Um, in Salem, we invited Portland General Electric. Portland General Electric has had a five megawatt, one to one and a half hour facility in Salem, Oregon, that they've been operating for a number of years. They call it the Smart Power Center. Um, the workshop included a tour of that facility, so the engineers were actually able to get into the facility and even take this thing for a test drive. They actually provided a number of grid functions in real time in front of everybody to see, and so we are grateful to have a facility within easy distance of our workshop. Portland General Electric also about, talked about <clears throat> future procurements that they're going to be making under an Oregon storage mandate. And so we got to see um, essentially a, a quick glance at the projects that they're planning for the next couple of years, which is going to include somewhere around 150 megawatt hours of storage in Portland General Electric territory. Um, all told, um, we we enlisted um, a few other utilities as well for discussion, but they were our primary utility partners for presentations. Um, we also had the national labs, and Dan Borneo um, was a was a star for us um, in both of our technical workshops. They provided the technical overview and trends, um, technology basics. A lot of the participants were um, interested in which chemistries and configurations and, um, you know, what are the trends within the industry overall, more so than just looking at these local projects. So we got a great rundown of battery ABCs from the national labs. Um, Pacific Northwest National Labs were also participating up in Washington. And all told, we ended up with more than 80 participants and we reached utility engineers from 12 different utilities. And so we considered that to be a success. And like I said, we'll be doing three more of these next year. So I will stop there. Okay, thanks a lot, Rob. Uh, we're going to go now to Matt from Eugene Water and Electric Board who will tell us a bit more about the project in particular, uh, how it fits into eWeb's system. Uh, I just want to remind everyone two things. One, uh, we are limited in time, and we do have uh, another couple of speakers after Matt, so if everyone could try to keep it brief, I think that we have a lot of questions already coming in, and we'd like to get to as many of those as possible. And the other thing I want to say is if you do have a question, uh, go ahead and type it in because uh, I'll be, I'm already going through them and uh, I'd like to try to um, do the best we can to, to address them all. It's helpful if you send it in a little early. Okay, thank you. And we'll move now to Matt Ibaraki from Eugene Water and Electric Board. Hi, uh, so my name is Matt Ibaraki, I'm a staff electrical engineer at uh, Eugene Water Electric Board, which is like a small utility in Eugene, Oregon. We have about like 90,000 meters. Uh, we serve both water and electric. Uh, so I'm also the PM for this uh, grid edge demonstration project. Uh, this presentation will go over project basics, uh, what we plan to do with it, and then uh, some challenges and lessons we've learned uh, along the way. Uh, so I guess we'll go over the project partners who is involved in this project. Uh, so first, we have the utility eWeb. Uh, we submitted a proposal to get a grant, and the grant team that was assembled uh, consisted of uh, Sandy National Labs, uh, Oregon Department of Energy, and CESA. Uh, they've all been great partners in this project and have provided a lot of uh, technical experience uh, through their previous projects, and they gave us a lot of good uh, feedback on, on when we had issues. Uh, next on the list is Rolly Parsons. They're the uh, design build contractor. Uh, essentially, we gave them the specs and then they did everything from procurement to install installation and uh, 
commissioning. Battery manufacturer is NEC. Uh, the inverter manufacturer is uh, West Tech, which is a German company. And then Eugene School District uh, 4J was the site that we installed the batteries at. And also, I would definitely want to give a special thanks to uh, Dr. Ima Zhuk uh, for providing funding for us and kind of giving us support and especially being a bit patient with us uh, in the few years it took us to kind of get this project up and running. So the main goal of the grant, which was uh, given out by the Oregon Department of Energy was to essentially just build more battery storage in Oregon. And so for this grant, uh, we installed, we uh, promised to install 500 kilowatts, uh, 1000 kilowatt hours of energy storage, run it for at least a year, make sure we were able to do all the things that we said it was gonna do, uh, including testing some use cases and then uh, conducting an optimization study, which I think is a pretty important part of it, uh, where we kind of figure out which benefits uh, monetize it best and how best to use it, uh, given kind of the economics of uh, Pacific Northwest power. So the main focus for our battery storage was resiliency. Um, as you can see in the slides, the kind of the hot one right now is that Cascadia subduction zone earthquake, which is a fairly periodic and potentially very catastrophic earthquake that kind of just brought to light, you know, that we need to make sure we have a plan. Whether or not this big earthquake happens, we should have a plan to make sure that, you know, people are taken care of. And as a water utility, kind of one of our main concerns is to make sure people have water. Like without electricity, things are inconvenient, but without water, things get kind of dire. Um, so I think a lot of utilities in the Pacific Northwest are kind of looking at that and seeing uh, what kind of plans they can make. So for us, uh, as I said, we kind of focused on water and we want to be able to provide water and extended outage. And we've decided to take a distributed approach by installing wells in various parts of town. Uh, we've gotten two wells installed so far uh, and we want to kind of try and cover a majority of the area with some type of supply like that. So how do we as utility intend to use it? So the obvious use for it is, you know, just to back up the building, which, you know, you can build battery anywhere and do that. But uh, what the main, I think, goal for this is to make sure it can provide power to that pump as long as possible. Like we're talking, if some transmi big transmission outage occurred, it could be possibly over a week, two weeks, and we need to have some source of water for the people. So working through this problem, trying to figure out what are good solutions to this, uh, to see how long we can stretch the power out. Um, the second goal is to do research, uh, help figure out what the Pacific Northwest economic looks like, the whole field looks like for energy storage, and then also for EUP to figure out what its own personal interconnection standards are going to look like. We kind of, it's nice to have one you can talk about as much as you want, but having one kind of highlights a bunch of things that we may not have thought about. And then lastly, the economics of actually using it, you know, it's not going to be providing, it's not going to be in backup mode for majority of its lifetime. So what can we do in the meantime to utilize it? So the project site's a hard elementary. It's a pretty new school, it was rebuilt in 2016. K through five, 400 students uh, peak monthly loads of about 250 kilowatts. So potentially four hours of storage if we backed up the entire building during a peak. Uh, the system essentially right now looks like this, uh, has about 50 kilowatts of PV, uh, has an ATS system, I think with an 80 kilowatt natural gas generator. Uh, we decided not to integrate with the gas to have, you know, some type of charging with that just due to complexity. We just left the ATS scheme alone. Um, we, so you can see here, we have two battery systems, the BFS1 and BS2, and those are both controlled by the uh, onboard 
Eros microgrid controller that NEC makes. Uh, the main disconnection point is at that main breaker there, at the main panel. So this is the bird's eye view of the uh, new campus. And here you can see in blue down there where the uh, storage containers were installed with the uh, batteries there in the southeast part of that field, kind of away from the uh, play zones. Then there's also that arrow pointing to the well. We tried to keep it somewhat near to uh, help with uh, cost for trenching. Uh, that from that electrical room, it's not too far. So we'd have to, tr we trenched across a, a sidewalk through a building up some stairs and then down into the electric room. Um, for equipment, uh, we have the NEC DSS, which is their distribution level system. It's, uh, we have it at the kind of the max uh, configuration with six bays. Each one gives 280 kilowatts, 510 kilowatt hours. So we have two of those units uh, paired with a West Tech uh, inverter for each. Uh, for fire suppression, we have a Novak 1230 agent that was installed by a local contractor. And we are currently using the built-in Eros controller. For timeline, uh, just some quick things in here. For us, procurement took about two months from releasing the bid to uh, intent to award. Design took about three months, construction one and a half, and then commissioning was about two weeks. So total from when we signed the contract to when it was done and ready to go is about seven months. Uh, just gonna jump through some of these construction photos pretty quick. Uh, there the, the uh, civil guys digging out the hole for the pad, uh, 12 inch thick pad for the uh, main BESS and the uh, inverters, the BES, BESSs are on the right with those six conduits sticking out with the inverters on the other side, or sorry, the other way around. Um, here's the contractors placing the battery systems Uh, the well was constructed by a different third party, a uh, big old drill, 150 feet, estimated 10 horsepower pump and 80 gallons per minute. And here's the finished product. Uh, so on the right side, we have the two inverters. Behind those are the two battery systems. And on the left is just a big storage connex for the uh, water manifold. So the idea is when we get an outage, we can get the, to go in that connex and get all this equipment out to distribute all the water. There's like probably like 50 or so spigots so that multiple people can use it at a time. So some of the challenges we faced, uh, originally we were looking at this project, we had all utility owned uh, sites that we were looking at, but then we kind of went to this distributed, you know, well system to provide water for the people and those didn't quite make sense. We wanted an area with you know, parking or a flow through so that cars can drive through and pick up water. And that kind of brings up some interesting issues once you start putting projects behind customer meters. Uh, the first part being the meter itself. It's since the utility paid for it, uh, we didn't think it was fair if the uh, 4J was paying all the bills for charging the battery losses, HVAC, uh, they can get hit by a bunch of charges. So we kind of have to work a little behind the scenes. And if anyone's ever worked with like a customer information system, it's always clunky to try and get these custom bills out. And so that just adds an extra bit of work that uh, we have to do to make sure the bill's correct. Um, use case selection, there was some kind of argument as to what we would be running at a time. Since we paid for it, we decided that we were gonna be the ones selecting it but at the time the school thought that they were gonna do it. So kind of hashing that out in a, an agreement ended up what we had to do. Um, another challenge was the delayed start. So we decided to not have it immediately turn on like a UPS. We wanted to wait until someone turned it on. And the idea being, you know, in a major disaster, you wouldn't necessarily need to run out there immediately. It was, People should have some, you know, water supplies that should last maybe a day. So we 
they don't want to have it turn on immediately and drain all the batteries before eWeb staff was ready to actually man these sites. Uh, issue with that being a lot of the battery systems have UPSs that are required for it to run and those run out in a matter of hours. And so not having it start kind of gives you an issue where you could potentially come back to a dead, not a dead battery, the battery be full of power, but these UPSs to run it are all dead. And essentially you just have this big heavy paperweight. And so figuring out a way to uh, preserve those UPS power to turn on when you need it is some challenge that we're still trying to figure out how we want to manage. Um, one other thing, we opted out of a more advanced controller and we thought that it had some of the capabilities, but it didn't. Uh, primarily due to cost, the more advanced controllers were almost, I think, half the cost of the battery system itself. And so that didn't seem to scale quite right with what we wanted. And the built-in seemed to do quite a bit. Uh, one big thing that it could not do is uh, charge the batteries while islanding, which is kind of a big thing with, you know, resiliency storage product. You want it to be able to charge the battery. It can offset the load. And then also one thing that happens if the PV is greater than the load, the best will just shut off. And so having a system that can manage the solar, you know, ramp it up and down and charge the battery will require a controller upgrade. So our main lessons learned are uh, consolidating the battery inverter seems to be a pretty good way to go. Uh, we had two separate systems, as you saw, the inverter and the DSS separately. Having them kind of in the same connex or whatever would definitely make it a lot easier to install. You would have less protrusions out of uh, the pad. It just makes it way easier to wire. Uh, and then we'd want to beef up the specifications around uh, those kind of challenges that we mentioned to make sure there is a solution in place to make sure those are addressed. A lot of those came up later, like we didn't add the delayed start till later. So uh, we kind of had to work with what we had and kind of make some little adjustments along the way. Uh, also, as I mentioned before, utility owned sites or the whoever's owning it should be running it and have ownership of that site. It just makes it a lot simpler. I mean, that's not always going to be the case, but uh, it definitely makes it a lot cheaper to run. And then the keeping an eye on the CNI space for microgrid controllers. A lot of them are grid level. So they only, they come in these big packages. When you have a big system, the cost of the controller is small, but as you bring the system down, it doesn't scale quite well. And so I think some controller manufacturers are seeing that and are, are trying to find solutions that fit more in that CNI space that uh, has much better value. All right, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate if you got any questions at the end. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Matt. We will now hear very uh, quickly from Phil Fisher from NEC on the battery system that was used in this project. And then we'll hear from Alex Headley from Sandia regarding the economics uh, evaluation and analysis that that's been done for the project. Great, thanks, Paul. Uh, as mentioned, uh, I'm Phil Fisher with NEC Energy Solutions. Uh, NEC Energy Solutions is a full service end-to-end -end turnkey provider of energy storage solutions. Uh, we're offering these uh, energy storage systems as well as the technical and economic analysis, the commissioning and maintenance, warranties, uh, all for systems from the megawatt scale to the kilowatt uh, scale. We've been doing this since the mid-2000s, became part of NEC in 2014, uh, and our business unit uh, is based here outside of Boston and responsible for all things uh, energy storage. So we're excited to be part of, uh, of this project, uh, excited to be part of this um, webinar today. Uh, what we started to realize uh, approximately two and a half years ago is that the uh, so-called uh, grid edge uh, started to become blurry between some of the benefits between the uh, host premises behind the meter type customers, as well as the distribution uh, utilities. In other words, there was a cooperative type of uh, arrangement where energy storage could be able to provide uh, new energy services, uh, things such as uh, cost optimization for the users, 
through demand charge reduction or other uh, so-called uh, peak shaving, as well as uh, ability to be able to ensure you match the uh, so-called consumption with uh, when the generation would be uh, most apt in terms of uh, cost or emissions. And folks are also looking uh, for resiliency ways to be able to integrate uh, renewables as well as uh, provide backup power. From the distribution utility uh, side, they were looking for ways that they could be able to have dispatchability of CNI load to effectively manage their distribution and to be able to ring out uh, efficiencies, uh, economy of scale, as well as uh, optimization of these uh, assets uh, and to result in better costs. So by doing this, they had uh, efficient utilization. This led us uh, to going on an approach of uh, being able to create uh, an all-in-one scalable, smart, simple, compact, uh, safe, and cost-effective uh, solution that folks could be able to pick in place, a fully assembled system. And that's what this DSS system is here today uh, that is uh, out uh, in Eugene. This is a fully factory assembled uh, system uh, that integrates uh, the uh, so-called controls, the DC medium, which in this case happens to be lithium ion uh, chemical energy storage or batteries, uh, as well as that balance of plant and conversion things such as the thermal management, the power conversion uh, equipment, uh, and wrapping it all into an outdoor-based uh, enclosure. Knowing that storage is something that you want to be able to have uh, simple, repeatable, and eventually mundane type deployments, uh, these have full certification and compliances that are uh, required by the industry. So this is really where energy storage is moving towards, something that uh, is simple uh, and something that just works. Uh, and what we see here uh, at this site uh, in Eugene is something that was uh, simply deployed, uh, something that can fit uh, effortlessly into the environment that you see here. So these are the two aerial photos of how not only the battery energy storage system was placed by the EPC firm, Worley Parsons, but how the balance of plant equipment was uh, well situated with the uh, surroundings providing safety as well as the proper aesthetics so that uh, they could achieve those uh, outcomes uh, desired. So thrilled to be part of this, uh, and we're looking forward to energy storage uh, eventually becoming this thing that uh, uh, is uh, repeatable and a mundane type uh, process. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Phil. We now turn to Alex Headley from Sandia to discuss the uh, economic and uh, technical evaluations that were done, mostly focused on maximizing savings and uh, optimal dispatch. And I just want to remind everyone, including Alex, that we are a little bit behind. I'd like to leave sufficient time to get to a bunch of questions. So if you can um, do this in, a, in an efficient way and, and uh, try to leave at least 20 minutes, that would be terrific. Thank you. Yeah, great. I'll, I'll try to go through this quickly. So um, as kind of Matt mentioned and some of the others, one of the goals of this project was to look at what the economic value that this battery storage system could provide um, when it wasn't being used for these backup power types of situations. So the rest of the time, how can you operate the battery to try to get some additional value out of it? So given the um, given the battery specifications, we make some assumptions about uh, the efficiency of the battery and the state of charge range that we want to operate in. Uh, we want to look at reducing the customer's electricity charges, so the customers of eWeb, Howard uh, Elementary in this case, and also look at the potential value uh, to eWeb as kind of a customer of, of BPA. So uh, this all really depends on, on having the right data to input. Um, so eWeb provided a monthly summary of, of the bills that Howard Elementary was seeing um, and generation from, from half the solar array, and we kind of assumed double that for both the, of the solar arrays. Um, and we also were provided with hourly load estimates for the building, um, for the building's load, and then hourly PV generation we, we got from the PV watts calculator, which is kind of a, something that you can do online rather easily for uh, for the longitude and latitude, the location of your of your building, and you can assume um, some things there about the inverter efficiency and what have you. 
Um, so looking here at the behind the meter uh, value first for Howard Elementary, um, there are no time of use pricing differences that the battery can really take advantage of, but really the, the major benefit that can be provided by a battery here is reducing the peak monthly demand. So that, that is a big part of the charge that uh, that the school um, is charged for for their electric, electricity bills. Here. So uh, one thing here, since we're working with simulated load data and PV generation data, just to kind of make things a little more representative of the actual situation, we scaled um, those loads based on the monthly summary data that, that eWeb provided us. And then really we're just setting up an optimization algorithm. This is being done in, in Python. Um, which is you know open source tool and Pyoma is a open source optimization tool kit that's a part of uh, Python that was developed here at Cindy as well. So all of this is open source, so this could be done by by others rather easily. Um, and what we're doing here is minimizing the electricity bill um, within the the framework of the model. So we have a model for the battery state of charge, uh, putting energy into and out of the battery, um, and also we have uh, the constraints of the demand and the PV generation loads that we're, we're simulating. Um, so you can see on the top right there really what the battery is doing in the red is without the energy storage system. Um, you see these these very high peaks and uh, and lower valleys that, uh, that kind of occur naturally. And what the battery is working to do is discharging during these times where the peaks will be rather high to reduce that overall peak and then kind of charging um, in between that time, and, and all of this reduces the the peak demand that the the school is put, is requiring, um, and that is a, a pretty big benefit to their monthly bill by reducing that peak demand. You can do that by a, reduce it by about 50% um, most months, and that amounts to about uh, $6,000 of annual savings. Um, which is actually a pretty big, a significant chunk of what their their bill was. So about uh, 10 to 20 percent on average, about 18 percent, um, depending on the month. And you get particularly large benefit during these months where there's very high demand. In the summer months, while there are still students there, like in June, you can see here. Um, now we're going to look quickly at the potential value to eWeb as buying uh, buying and selling energy from BPA. So uh, eWeb does have to deal with with hourly pricing fluctuations um, that are mandated by BPA or set by BPA. So that's really where the battery can benefit here is an energy arbitrage, buying low and selling high, as was mentioned earlier, and also uh, coincident peak demand charge. So at the, the peak load for the entire area serviced by BPA, if you can reduce your demand during that time, you can reduce your, your monthly bills quite a, quite a bit as well. Um, so this is an example here on the top right again of what the battery is doing, discharging when prices go high and then recharging overnight when prices are low. Um, and this is really what we're taking advantage of. Um, and again, one thing to mention here is that this optimization routine does assume perfect forecast. So this is kind of an upper limit on what you could expect to get from these uh, grid services, arbitrage and, and reducing that coincident peak. Um, but all told, it's, it's actually quite a bit of money that could be $20,000 in annual savings um, by, per, by participating in those, those two functions with the battery. Um, but this is maybe does speak somewhat to what Matt was, was talking about as to who is running the battery and who owns the battery. So there's about $6,000 sa $6, per year in savings for uh, the behind the meter application about twenty thousand for for eweb but the discharge uh, schedule for the battery for those two cases is not at all the same um, so they're not exactly compatible as it's as you see here so in red is what how you would operate the battery to optimize for uh, to minimize the howard elementary electric bill and for eweb it's a, it's a lot more aggressive just taking advantage of those hourly pricing differences so very different uh discharge profile um so kind of merging those two maybe looking at how how those things will go together is is uh, something that we can look at more in the future eweb also had mentioned some other potential 
services or, or value streams that the battery could engage in, such as demand response, uh, power quality support, transmission congestion relief, um, et cetera. Um, but these are more things that we can consider in the future, and we're, we're going to continue to work with eWeb to, to push this further. Um, as a last quick note here, I did want to mention this this code that we used to do this analysis was kind of a one-off code, again, in Python and Payamo. But at Sandia, we have been developing a, a larger tool, a quest valuation tool is what it's called, um, that can do these similar types of analyses for for more general areas so where there's a there's a system now uh, in as part of the software to download and the hourly pricing data for different market areas um, and then we can uh, there's kind of a nice wizard that's been developed for all of this where you can pick your your market area um, pick your pricing nodes and then depending on the, the parameters that you set and, and the um, what functions you want the battery to perform, you can get to, uh, get to potential values that you could get from the battery in that situation. So revenue that you could obtain by month, by which value stream regulation uh, tends to be the, the, the big cash cow here and um, et cetera, et cetera. There's more functionality that is going to be coming to this in the future. We're looking at adding some behind the meter types of valuation, similar to the analysis that was done here. Um, additional market areas are being added and uh, technology assistant, uh, selection assistance, um, cost estimation, and things like that are going to be added long-term. So this quest valuation tool is, is available now. Um, the link is there, uh, it's a GitHub link. It's all open source and uh, yeah, open to uh, and available. So I'd just like to quickly thank Dr. Zhuk for his support of all of these efforts and um, hopefully I didn't take up too much time. I'm going to answer questions, of course. Great, thank you, Alex, and thanks to everybody who presented. I think uh, we're doing fine, we have about 23 minutes left for questions, and we do have a lot of questions. I'll try to direct them as best I can so that we don't have five people answering every question. Um, Alex, I just, uh, you know, that that uh, valuation wizard is very, it seems very useful, and I wonder whether at some point in the future we might look at doing a webinar to explain how to use it, especially if you're adding additional features. Um, I think there'd be a lot of people interested in, in tuning in for, for a little yeah, uh, I, workshop on that. Yeah, I imagine so. I, I know that's been on our radar to do a webinar about, about how to use the tool and what have you. That'd be, Ricky Concepcion will be the, the one running that, I think, in the future, but yeah. Definitely. Okay, great. So let me start going through questions here. Um, somebody wants to know, when designing storage for resiliency, how many days of backup power should we aim for? And I, I want to just put a, a comment in here. Resiliency is obviously different. Um, there's no standard definition. Um, often we're looking at, in, as in this case, a resilient... Uh, resiliency for certain systems, so for water or for um, provision of emergency services or for a shelter or something of that nature. And obviously, resilience in an earthquake, uh, as in uh, the Eugene system, is going to look different from resilience uh, in the case of, for example, a winter storm or a hurricane, uh, such as you might encounter in the northeast or the, or the southeast. So having said that, um, how do we de how do we design for resilience? How many days are we looking at in terms of storage? And then how does the solar or other generation component of these systems get sized so that uh, you don't simply run down the battery and then call it a day? And I, I think we we might well let's let's open this up. I, I would think somebody f either from eWeb or uh, Sandia or, or DOE perhaps might want to speak to it. Well, why don't I get it started? The point is it depends very much on what you call resilient. Uh, obviously, the simplest thing is if you have 
a planned outage or an outage that you're fairly sure is going to last only for a few hours. A uh, tree across a, a transmission line or whatever it is. Uh, in that case, uh, you just provide what you what you can. Uh, minimum four hours in general. Uh, we'd like to do it for six hours. If it comes to a real emergency, snowstorm, what have you, it's essential that you are not planning to supply the entire facility, but only mission critical functions of it. So for example, you might keep some of the lights on, but not all of them. Uh, you might uh, keep uh, television communication equipment on. You might provide uh, charging for cell phones. Uh, and as we just heard, you might provide water. Then of course, there are people who are thinking of much larger things where if you have renewable sources that are working, uh, you could conceivably, if you reduce it, if you reduce your uh, consumption to mission critical, uh, keep it on indefinitely. Uh, but that will take careful planning. So let me say that as a beginning. So hi, uh, this is Matt with UWeb. So for for us. Uh, I think we wanted to get the water as long as possible, given kind of the restraint constraint of size and location. Uh, with, of course, with solar, you would get much more you'd like than that. If we had peak solar during a major disaster, which you know is probably less likely. I mean, I'm thinking winter right. storms is going to happen in winter, uh, but. Say we had solar, we could probably stretch that for a couple of weeks, and that would be great for water. But it, it really depends on how you know what disaster you're planning for. For a giant earthquake where we you know may lose transmission, that could be a lot longer than we have you know energy storage for. And to build something to that scale, you have to kind of weigh the how you want that to work. Like, are you going to try and provide water for months? Like that that seems a very big size of equipment that you need to have. So uh, I think for us, for these well pumps, I think we were looking between one and two weeks. We would, of course, like uh, Dr. Juk was saying, like shut off everything. We'd kind of work with the site to have kind of an emergency mode where they would just have a list of all the breakers they need to shut off since we don't have very advanced uh, building management systems. They would just shut off everything that wasn't mission critical. Uh, Mostly, I think we could just probably keep that pump on and maybe some lights, and that would probably be it. So I, <clears throat> this is Dan Borneo at Sandia. Just to add to Emery and Matt's comments, what what we have been looking at and encouraging is if you have an, a, a large load and you're looking at a long term, greater than eight hours, we're encouraging that you would have basically three systems. You would have your renewables, your energy storage, and some traditional generation. Uh, that given today's, where we are today with the technology and the cost, that seems to make the most uh, sense. Great, thank you all for, for that. Um, I, I also just want to mention that some of these municipal utility scale projects uh, have a, a storage component and a solar component that's oversized compared to the facility that's being uh, provided with backup power in an emergency because there are other uh, applications for which a larger generation and storage component makes sense. So for example, in this case, if you're offsetting or if you're if you're saving uh, money through reducing demand at the utility scale, um, it it may make sense to have a, a battery and a solar system considerably larger than what you would otherwise put behind the meter at a school. Um, 
It may not in some cases, but we've seen that in Green Mountain Power, for example, here in Vermont, there's a school likewise being supported by a similar system, but it's a much larger system than you would ordinarily use to just support a school. And as a result, um, the resiliency is, is almost uh, potentially almost in, indefinite uh, at that facility. Okay, let me go to the next question. What are the O&M costs, uh, be operation and maintenance, and critical elements uh, for this system? I think we heard that uh, in another case, it was a, something like a $400 monthly maintenance. Sterling was $400 was per early. month. Yeah, do we, we have, have a figure for this one? They had budgeted a uh, thousand two hundred dollars but to their amazement it turned out to be just four hundred dollars great and they, so have, do we, they have more than a year's experience now do we, do we have a figure for from for uh, maintenance costs for the eweb system and do we have any kind of short list of what the most critical elements of that are um so i don't think we have that number quite yet. I mean, Phil, Phil might be able to fill in for some of that, but uh, I talked to the the uh, tech who set it up, and he said the yeah, these systems are uh, self-sufficient uh, operational type uh, systems. Other than the periodic uh, checkout uh, of the systems that might happen biannually, uh, cleaning of filters and items like that. Uh, these systems uh, would not have a significant preventative maintenance that is required with it. So the O&M costs uh, tend to be uh, very um, you know, low and uh, encourage the long-term sustainability of these uh, different financial requirements. Okay, so we're not sure, but sounds like we don't expect it to be overwhelming. That's that's the, I guess, the takeaway. Um, but it okay. would be good to have it on record. Right. So that's probably one of the things, uh, one of the data points that I imagine that we'll be looking to collect over the first year of, of operations here. Um, okay. Next question. How, how uh, This person wants to know whether it makes sense to buy a turnkey system, as in this case, or to lease a system, as in some of the other uh, cases. I think, um, Emory, you mentioned the Burlington Airport project earlier, and they're considering, they were considering leasing. Has anyone uh, looked at sort of the pros and cons and, and cost effectiveness of leasing versus owning a, a system of this, this size? Or do we know yet? I'm not sure we have enough experience. So um, uh, this is Dan Borneo at Sandia. You know, so what we've seen, Todd, as we're reviewing proposals is that, you know, it's all about the risk. And if you're putting the risk on the owner who will who own and operate, it's one cost. If you're putting the risk onto somebody else, the vendor, then they're going to try to recoup that that cost. So, you know, it's 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 going to be higher per per unit, if you will, of um, if you do a power purchase agreement, as it would be if you owned it outright. However, you know, you're transferring the risk, so you're only paying per kilowatt hour produced rather than paying for something that, you know, if it doesn't work, you're still paying for it. So it's a trade-off. Okay. Um, I, I could add as well that, that some of these systems, because they're getting grants from state entities, may they may not have the option to lease. Uh, the grant recipient, it, it, in some cases, needs to own the system simply because of the way the grants are structured. And that's something we've we've run across in in Massachusetts as well and other places. 
All right. Uh, somebody wants to know how you make a business case for a system whose revenue streams depend heavily on uncertain and volatile energy prices. Um, I imagine that uh, this is something that folks from eWeb and or Sandia may wa might want to speak to. How do you how do you do this? Uh, we know energy prices and energy service prices are are fluctuating, and this is a system that you're looking out at least ten years. Um, so, hi, this is Matt. Uh, I don't think we ever kind of fully developed a plan to figure out, you know, how do you monetize, you know, the the resource of water and providing, you know, it's it's kind of a hard thing to say when it's like life and safety. How how do you put a price tag on, you know, providing water to people? It, I'm not I'm not quite sure there's a good easy way to monetize that or to say there's a dollar. I guess maybe some avoided costs of having someone ship in water or building some other type of really hardened plant that can, you know, prevent the disaster in that case. Um, but from our standpoint, we didn't have a, I don't think we had a really specific number that we looked at when we kind of took that into account. So Todd, this is, this is Borneo Sandy again. Um, so through Emory's program, we're actually looking to start delving into that. And there's been a lot of talk, it, it, you know, how, and as Matt said, how do you put a price on resiliency? It's, it's an insurance, basically it's an insurance policy. And we're starting to look at that and we're starting to look at it through the eyes of actuarial science, just like somebody would um, put a price on an insurance policy. But we're in the early stages of that. And what we have been doing to date is basically looking at if you lose electricity, what is your lost production cost? So if you're in an industry, it's real easy. You know, if you're making widgets, well, you can't make widgets. How much is that going to cost us? Uh, if you're in the home and in, uh, in the commercial residential area, maybe not so much. Um, it'd be harder to put a price tag to it. Uh, obviously, if you're in like a hospital, well, you know, how much you put on a life if, if you don't have your critical components running. So, so but but the, the national labs uh, are, are taking that really seriously and, and trying to figure that out. And if, if I could add to this is Alex at, at Sandia. Um, if I could add to, I think from the pure kind of energy arbitrage um, revenue standpoint, um, there has been some work done here at Sandia um, on how much you can get um, from with reasonable control algorithms. And I was looking at in this analysis just the the perfect forecast kind of situation, but. Um, even with unperfect forecasts and, and price uncertainty, um, there's been some work to show that you can get a pretty good portion of that, 85% um, or more, uh, with kind of reasonable, reasonable, simple control algorithms. So um, even even though we don't know exactly how much you can get, there, there's a pretty good estimate here that you could get 80% of what we're kind of, kind of uh, putting out there. So. Okay. Thank you. Somebody is asking what the the concerns and options uh, are associated with battery end of life. Uh, I think that was brought up uh, by Emery in his introduction. But uh, or do we have any any more sort of detail around that? What how do you what do you do with these things at the end of life, and and who's responsible, and and what are the costs associated? Anybody? Anybody feel yeah, like taking that one? I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll give it a, a whack. So so a lot of times it's in the contract what who will own it at end of life. Um, I think probably the the safest bet at this juncture would be that whoever's purchasing it is going to own it. And if you look at lithium ion per se, since that seems to be the flavor of the month, um, you basically are going to take it to the landfill. Uh, then, because there, there's really no, very little recycling there. 
uh, say if, if you look at a vanadium flow battery, um, you could take the the electrolyte out and it still has value and it could be reused, but the rest of the, you know, the stacks and, and the pumps and, and the, um, the totes with the electrolyte in it would probably just go to the dump. Yeah, and I would add that, um, you know, obviously we're putting together as a manufacturer of these systems a very robust recycling plan when it comes specific to lithium ion. There is approximately 95% of the components that uh, can be recycled. Obviously, the industry is just building up those capacities uh, to mimic similar to what exists in the other uh, legacy battery space, uh, such as lead acid, but uh, cobalt, copper, aluminum, they can be recovered, separated, resmelted. Uh, the plastic fibers and other low valuable materials can be recycled to some degree. Uh, the cathode and other types of things can uh, go into place. The lithium metal and carbonate are also recycling depending on uh, commodity pricing. So I think as we see more of the systems, there is becoming a more of a robust type of recycling market that exists out there. Um, today, it's something that uh, the owners typically take on as a cost. But similar to other things, uh, we see that there may become residual value for owners of these systems when they get to, uh, to end of life. Yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> True. It does. It has a ways to go. Yeah, I mean, good luck trying to get the cobalt out of uh, your, uh, well, electrolyte, basically. Okay. Um, so we're 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 uh, we're 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 suspending our uh, judgment on the on the recycling issue. Um, I'm going to read this next question because it's a little long, but I think it's it's a good one. If a government entity wants to evaluate its opportunities and challenges for storage, what process do any of the speakers recommend? Should we hire a consultant to draft a plan or go it alone? Are there organizations that can help us? If hiring a consultant, what experience should we be looking for? Well, first of all, Organizations like the Department of Energy, through its national labs, uh, could be helpful for the first steps. Then there are organizations like the Clean Energy States Alliance that has a lot of experience uh, with plans of that type. Uh, you can buy a plan. There are companies like Strategy and whatnot that are quite happy to draw you up an extensive uh, uh, plan like uh, the way it was done in Massachusetts, for example, uh, or you can just uh, go do it smaller and uh, look at a number of other plans for various states that are already there and just pick and choose out of it what you like. I might add that this is Rob with Oregon Department of Energy. Um, we had another program that we were working with a one of our coastal utilities on to develop a tool which was essentially designed to prioritize resiliency spending. And the tool recognized that every community is likely going to have different priorities and we went in there with a utility partner with a heavy energy focus and you know how do you get the battery backup or the solar or this sort of things but for a lot of communities their their first investment for resiliency was you know first aid within the community or something along those lines but um, we have been working on developing essentially a priority spending tool which has yet to be fully developed, but is a work in progress. Yeah, okay. And I, I would say, uh, you know, call, call us or email us. I mean, this is this whole uh, webinar, the, this whole eWeb uh, project is an example of uh, real partnership between a um, municipal utility, a state energy agency, a national laboratory, 
uh, US DOE, a, a nonprofit organization, um, and industry in putting together a, a, a project that is essentially uh, breaking ground in terms of demonstrating the economics of energy storage in in a part of the country that that doesn't have uh, you know an ISO uh, like a forward capacity market or something or something of that nature where there are more challenges and yet um, you know it's worthwhile doing and we'll get we'll get good information we'll learn from it and it'll benefit the community um, so you know we've we mentioned earlier um, there are procurement guidelines that Sandia has published. There are tools that Sandia has has uh, developed and made available. Um, CISA has a lot of experience with working with states and and uh, on projects such as this. So you know, get in touch with us um, if you are on the on the webinar as a representative of a government agency or a municipal agency of some type and you're looking to develop energy storage um, you know this is this this team does this all over the country um, I think we're out of time unless somebody wants to add something or correct what I just said um, I we will thank our speakers once again and note that the webinar recording as well as the slides will be available on our website for download or if you want to share them with somebody. Samantha, do we have any upcoming webinars to announce? We are still working on scheduling some webinars for 2019, but we will have plenty. So I would encourage people to visit our website, cisa.org backslash webinars. That's where we post all of our upcoming webinars, and that's also where you can find a recording of this webinar. Great. Well, thanks, everybody, for attending. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. Um, happy holidays. Yes. Congratulations to the eWeb team, and uh, we will... Bring, we'll be back with more energy storage webinars in January.